everybody and welcome to Seed Speaks. This is a video series brought to you by Seed World Group. My name is Mark Zenkowitz and I am an editor with Seed World Group. And this month we're talking with experts about the future of plant breeding. I'm joined today by three experts to discuss something I've wanted to address for a while and that is this issue of the world population. Now we all know that the world population is set to hit 9 billion and keep exploding from there. We keep hearing, you know, 9 billion people by 2050. Feed the nine is a popular hashtag on Twitter. And, and, and we keep hearing about how eventually it'll hit 10 and 11 billion people and that the population is going to keep going up, 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 and we have to feed more and more people. But is that assumption really true? true not if you heed the words of daryl bricker and others who are actually preparing for a world with fewer people not more now daryl bricker is a political scientist pollster author speaker and ceo of public affairs for ipsos along with john ibbotson he co-authored the book empty planet the shock of global population decline which makes the case that the global population will actually soon begin to decline which will dramatically reshape the social political and economic landscape now daryl couldn't be on live with us today but he's going to join us in a pre-recorded interview i did with him the other week but on live with us today are evan roqueford ceo of indiana's nutramaze and hanale lindquist cruza she is leader of the genetics genomics and crop improvement section at the International Potato Center, and she's based in Peru. Welcome, everybody. How are you guys today? Excellent. Thank you. Well, very good. It, it's very good to see you. And, and now you both work in areas where you're able to bring your talents to a world where there might be fewer people, not more like we tend to think. Now, it makes sense that we think that the population is going to keep going up, 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 because that's been the conventional wisdom, because the population has been exploding for a number of years. As, as Daryl's going to point out, in 1950, we only had two and a half billion people on the planet. The UN just confirmed last November that we've hit a record 8 billion people. Now, that's between the years of 2023 and 1950. That's billions more people on the planet. But the UN actually confirmed something very interesting when it made their announcement in November. It still predicts the world population to hit 9 billion, but it says that the rate of global population growth is actually declining not increasing. Now, Evan and Hanale, before we hear from Daryl, I want to ask you each an important question. Now, Hanale, according to statistics from the International Potato Center, potato is the third most important food crop in the world after rice and wheat. Now, Hanale, in the course of your work with potato breeding, this idea of a, a shrinking world population, is this something that's being actively discussed and considered? And, and if so, what could that mean for potato breeding in your opinion? Uh, well, Mark, I, I think we are still considering and breeding for increased demand uh, based on the trend of growing production of potato, in particular in Asia and Africa. So uh, our target area for breeding are the emerging economies where potato is uh, food security in the cash crop. And uh, during the past decades, there has been a shift in potato production from the northern hemisphere to the global south. And we expect this trend to continue. And then besides the population size, there are also other factors that uh, we need to take into account, such as climate change, that will likely impact which crops can be grown where and the reduction of arable land. And these also affect our ability to produce enough food. I think I may have lost Evan for some reason, but that's okay. We'll keep rolling on and hopefully Evan will rejoin us in a moment. Now, Evan is, as I say, CEO for Nutramaze and they've brought orange corn 
to the North American population. This is a type of corn with enhanced nutritional characteristics, which we're going to hear about in a bit. But we're going to hear from Daryl now. Now, my talk with Daryl was just over five minutes, and he's going to explain this idea of a shrinking world population and its potential implications for the world of food. We'll hear from Daryl now. Thank you, Daryl, for joining us today on, on Seed Speaks. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Mark. Not a problem. Thank you for joining me. Now, I saw you speak a couple of years back at the Grow Canada conference, and you really uh, shattered some of this conventional wisdom that we all kind of have that the world population is exploding and then we're headed for a massive amount of people, billions of people, you know, 9 billion by 2050, 10 billion, sometimes we hear 11 billion. And your talk was all about how you don't think that's the case. The conventional wisdom, like I say, has been that we're going to hit 9 billion by 2050 and we need to breed crops to feed more people than ever. But you've laid out a convincing case that will likely top out at around 8.5 billion by 2050. And then the world population will actually begin to decline due to lower birth rates. And the United Nations actually recently lent some credence to your prediction by confirming that the rate of population growth is indeed slowing. To sort of set the stage for us, can you give us the 411 on your thoughts about this and some of the, of the data behind it? So the speech that you uh, saw me give, um, a lot of what I was saying was actually wrong. <laughs> and the reason it was wrong is this is all happening a lot faster uh, than, uh, than I suggested in the speech and John Ibbotson and I suggested in our, our book, Empty Planet, which I was, was speaking about. And uh, the reason for that is what's happened in the pandemic, but also what the response post-pandemic has been in terms of global fertility. And everything is happening a lot faster than we uh, suggested in the book. I mean, China is not supposed to be tipping into population decline for another decade. And they've basically announced this year that they already have tipped into decline. So, uh, you know, 36% of the globe's population is in two countries. That's India and China. Uh, both of them are well below, well, China's well below replacement rate, now in decline. And India's uh, popular birth rate has now declined below uh, uh, replacement levels. So that's what's going on. Now, you mentioned the explosion of global population. Yes, there has been an explosion of global population. Between 2000 and, uh, or 1950 and today, the global population has gone from 2.5 billion to 8 billion, which is just what the United Nations has, has confirmed. Um, but we're living at like almost the top edges of the of the cloud of the explosion. It's about to start coming down now. Uh, so we are not going to see 9 billion people by 2050. Uh, we will maybe get to 8.5 billion, maybe a little bit more, maybe a bit fewer. Uh, but we're not going to see 9 billion. And we're certainly not going to see the 10.4 billion that the UN is currently projected. Just to put this into context for your listeners, uh, the UN in 2017 projected there'd be 11.2 billion people by 2100. Today, actually, as you said at the end of last year, uh, they put out another projection that was 10.4 billion people by the end of uh, end of the century. Uh, that's a decline of 800 million people in their projections in just five years, just five years, and they're going to keep adjusting those projections as we roll forward because that's the reality of what's happening on the ground. Now, like I say, us working in agriculture often just assume that we're going to have 9 billion by 2050 and it's going to keep going up, up, up from there. And if that's not indeed the case, in your opinion, what are, what are the general implications for, for agriculture? I think the general implications are, you know, first of all, job well done. I mean, agriculture's figured out a way to fill, feed the global population uh, in a way that uh, Robert Malthus never predicted. In fact, we were supposed to well outgrow our our uh, our capacity to be able to feed the population, and this was, you know, the whole Malthusian model. One, you know, uh, uh, population growth went up uh, much more rapidly than our ability to feed people, and it turned out he was wrong. 
Robert Ehrlich was wrong too about our ability to uh, to feed the population. In 1980, you know, 82, we were supposed to be struggling in the, in the streets over the last scrap of bread. Well, that hasn't happened. So the global agricultural community has more than stepped up to the challenge of, of feeding the world's population. That has, as I said before, exploded. But if they're thinking that they have to continue to find out new ways to increase yields or uh, to uh, you know, field feed of populations is going to be 10.4 billion people. You can rest easy. That's not going to happen. Now, this brings up an interesting question. If if we don't really necessarily have to breed so much for yield anymore, if we don't have to worry about feeding these huge amounts of people, then that opens up possibilities for plant breeders to breed for other things. Uh, if, if we're dealing with an aging population, for example, maybe we can breed with, with nutrition in mind, maybe with the intentions of, you know, staving off some uh, age-related illnesses that maybe are related to nutrition or something like that. What, what possibilities do you think this might open for, for people who are actually creating food? Also think softness think softness because you know older people sometimes have problems chewing and dental issues and the rest of it so you know breeding for that i i really do think that it's not just the size of the population you have to take into account it's the structure of the population and particularly in affluent markets western markets in uh, in, uh, in in the world you're going to be dealing with a rapidly aging population i mean even looking at our country in canada you know the average canadian today median age Canadians, 42 years old. In Japan, it's 48 years old. In Italy, it's 48 years old. So we have a really rapidly uh, aging population. So not only is the population not going to grow to the level that we thought, it's going to age a lot faster than we thought as well, too. The fastest growing segment of the global population right now is the oldest pop part of the population. It's those 60 years of age or older. And even more in places like Canada, people who are 80 years of age or older. So I bet you people are in the agriculture industry are, are not thinking of them as their core consumer. Well, those are your core consumers because We've stopped having kids at the level that we used to have them. And youth is not going to drive the market, at least for the next 25 to 30 years. It's going to be that older segment of the population that's not going away, which is why in one book I wrote, I referred to them as the perennials, the group that doesn't go away. And so start thinking of a smaller group of people more focused on the older part, older segment of the population. And that's the, that's the future market. Breeding for perennials. I like that. That's... That is a great headline. So thank you so much, Daryl, for your insights. I'm looking forward to hearing from our other panelists. And have a great day, sir. You too. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much, Daryl, for that. That is definitely food for thought. Evan, you're back. Good to see you back. I just want to back up a moment, Evan. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, when you fell off the line, Nutrimaze has brought orange corn to the North American population. This is a type of corn with enhanced nutritional characteristics, which we're going to get to in a bit. Uh, but I'm just curious, this concept of population decline, Evan, you and I talked about this a uh, couple of weeks back, and I'm curious, how, how has this affected your thinking in your daily work, this idea that you know we're actually gonna have a decline in world population, maybe not the big explosion like we think. How does that, how does that affect you in, in your job being, or, or creating orange corn? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Uh, for me personally, I, I think it actually doesn't affect um, the way that we think about what we do that much because we've already been focusing on breeding for um, better nutritional quality, for culinary, um, you know, aspects like flavor uh, and texture, right? We, we, we sell grits, which is a very soft product, um, you know? And so I think that, you know, looking at the population decline, it's also, it's not just um, looking at, okay, total demand might diminish, right? Um, but, you know, the, the grain market um, is multifaceted and you, there's gonna be dynamics and where the, where the growth is happening, uh, where the aging is happening, you know, a lot of the growth is going to happen uh, in Africa, right? Which is a is a, many of these places are culinary corn cultures, right? Where they eat a lot of corn. Um, in America, we only eat one to two percent of our corn is actually milled, dry milled into food. Um, Forty plus percent is made into ethanol, and um, you know, I think with the electrification of vehicles, um, we're going to see that decline significantly uh, over the same time period of, of potential population. 
uh, sort of uh, growth slowing and, and potentially declining. And so um, I think that there are a number of factors that are going to um, play into um, the market moving more towards quality, um, you know, rather than just quantity. Uh, obviously, quantity is always going to be uh, a big factor, but I think that there's going to be a lot of opportunities for, um, you know, diverse uh, and differentiated corn varieties. Yeah, well, and like Daryl says, uh, even if the population doesn't hit 9 billion, 10 billion people, we're still going to have billions of people on this population, <laughs> uh, on this on this planet who, who have to be fed. But like you say, it's interesting, if we don't have to worry so much about yield, then we can, yeah, think a lot more about quality. And, and in terms of quality, Hanalei, I'm curious what the implications are for potato. I know last time I spoke to you, we were tossing some ideas around for this episode of Seed Speaks. And you, 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 you mentioned one thing that it might be possible like to, to breed a potato that like cooks faster, which, you know, could be great for people like in urban environments who don't have a lot of time to, uh, to, to cook, that if they had a potato that didn't take as long to cook, that that, that could be something that would be possible. This idea, Hanalei, of, of breeding for quality, what are your thoughts on, on what this means from, for, uh, in terms of potato breeding? Uh, can you sort of give us uh, a synopsis of, of your work and, and, and this, this idea of a declining population, what it might mean in terms of, of breeding for, for quality characteristics in potato? Okay, Mark. Uh, so um, we have already managed to breed potatoes that have a 40, uh, no, 50 percent higher level of iron and zinc as compared to the current commercial varieties. Um, these varieties have a slightly lower yield than, um, than uh, current commercial varieties. So in this case, it could be um, a good idea to not to fix to, to think so much of the yield, but I, I do still think that yield is is important uh, trait in potato, and uh, in in these bio biofortified potatoes because to register a variety the ticking point and also um, for the farmers they may be more hesitant to adopt such a variety. We are currently trying to find a creative way to market these potatoes as a special healthy product that doesn't, where yield is not so important. Um, and I think in future we may see more demand on such uh, specialty products that are tailored more for health conscious consumer groups and uh, this may then uh, prompt us to shift some of our breeding targets to this direction. But there are several other quality traits that we are breeding for. Um, so we, we do consumer um, studies and uh, those guide then uh, our breeding targets. So people like things like uh, short cooking time, like you mentioned, and uh, flavor and, and many different kinds of aspects. So all of these are important. Yeah, for sure. And this definitely opens up a lot of possibilities. Like you say, yield definitely still is important. But uh, thinking about other things, like you say, quality characteristics, the sky is is the limit. Now, now, Evan, I'm curious about orange corn in particular. Can you talk a little bit about what orange corn is exactly and, and how this idea of breeding for quality characteristics could open up new possibilities for it? Yeah, sure. So yeah, so orange corn here um, is higher in carotenoids, uh, same kind of uh, antioxidant compounds, pigments that make carrots orange. Um, also, it's what makes yellow corn yellow. We just have a lot more um, in our corn, about two to four times more, depending on what you compare it to. Um, and so, you know, what we're doing is we're focusing on breeding varieties that are high in carotenoids, and we're also becoming increasingly interested in uh, protein and oil as well. Um, if you look at sort of corn over the past, you know, 50, 60 years um, in breeding, you know, really, really focused on yield, um, starch levels have gone up and protein and oil levels have gone down, um, you know, sort of on average. And so, you know, we're really interested in, in looking at not just um, sort of, you know, the yield as the, the only value that's produced on an acre of corn, right? That's right now, that's what farmers get compensated based on. But how can we create 
um, value chains where other traits can be captured. The value can be captured and compensated for. So for us, we're very much uh, interested in working on developing value chains in organic poultry feed because organic um, laying hen producers, uh, egg producers, they spend a lot of money on pigment and we can replace that with our orange corn. And so maybe the corn will cost a little bit more. Um, a premium, you know, can be paid to the farmer and that can make up for a potential, um, you know, small, small difference in the yield. Um, but the overall value that's being produced on that acre in terms of nutrition um, is going to be higher, uh, especially if you start stacking things like protein and oil with it, right? Because, because they're not, they're not just looking at the corn going to the diet. They're looking at what's the total cost of formulating that diet to get the outcome that they want. And so I think that um, if we're going to pull off, uh, you know, breeding for growing crops that are more nutritious, um, we need to be looking at markets as well because farmers grow what people are buying, um, you know, and, that, and that's just, you know, the reality. And so um, it's, it's, it's what I like to call, you know, what we're working on is consumer focused agriculture is we want to breed for traits that are important to the consumer not just the producer, and then capture that value in the value chain so it can be pulled through um, and make that impact, that nutritional impact um, for the consumer, that taste impact for the consumer. Now, this idea of, of breeding for the consumer and, and you know, we need, um, we need to be able to do this technologically, right? And, and when you look at different regulatory hurdles around the world, et cetera, that can be, that can be a challenge to say the least. Hanalei, uh, being, you know, somebody who specializes in this area, especially, you know, molecular breeding and things from, from a technological perspective, what, what needs to happen in order to, to enable uh, this sort of breeding for all these different quality traits? Um, well, first of all, we have to be able to measure what we want to improve. And many of the quality traits are difficult and costly to measure from roots and tuber crops. And if you think about all the post-harvest processing, such as washing, peeling, cutting and cooking needed before, then that you can actually measure that, that trait that you're interested in. Some traits are easy, such as uh, beta carotene content that can be just visually estimated based on the root color and sweet potato. But there are other traits that are more tricky and, and for these we really need to develop methods that are accurate and that we can quantify the traits and then that we can use these methods in a cost efficient way. And the cost really is a key here. So. You mentioned my background in molecular breeding. So the, the DNA-based analysis and genomics is currently very affordable. And those prices have come down, down really dramatically by a data point during the past years. And I think that something similar needs to happen for phenotyping for these quality traits so that we can uh, enable faster progress in, in breeding for these traits. Evan, what do you think uh, when you think about, you know, technology, regulatory hurdles, is how, how can we enable uh, these sorts of things in, in regards to, to corn breeding specifically? Yeah, I mean, I think that <laughs> it's a much broader conversation about um, genetic editing and modifying technologies. You know, we don't... Um, we don't do any genetic modification. We, we just strictly breed um, using traditional uh, plant breeding methods. And one of the reasons we're able to do that is because there's a huge amount of diversity in corn, right? Um, there's, ver there's, there's variation for carotenoid production. Um, that, that's not the case in rice, right? That's why, you know, um, golden rice uh, is, is transgenic. Um, and so, you know, those are, those are much broader um, you know, geopolitical conversations. But, you know, for us, what we're interested in doing is breeding things that are culturally appropriate um, for, you know, the, the, the markets that um, need them or we'd like to address, you know. And so orange corn that was originally developed for sub-Saharan Africa, it had to be non-GMO because that was the, the sort of regulatory cultural framework that uh, it was operating in. And so, um, you know, here in the United States, um, you know, we're, we're achieving the things that we want to achieve without genetic modification. And so, um, 
you know, there's really no need to, to, to jump through those hurdles or, or, or to sort of uh, have to spend that sort of capital to get, so to get a trans gene uh, approved. But, you know, when it comes to, to other things, there are many things that you can't accomplish through, um, you know, traditional breeding. And so I think, you know, as a society, we just have to evaluate um, what the costs and, and benefits are. And, um, you know, there's also other conversations about, um, you know, where where the where these technologies are are encouraging our our food systems to go you know are they becoming are we becoming more um biologically symbiotic and ecologically sound or are they encouraging us to move towards um you know heavily chemical you know input based systems and um i personally believe that the future of agriculture is is in you know biological symbiosis not um chemical inputs and so um, that's that's the area that we want to be working on, uh, working towards, and breeding for. Yeah, definitely, lots of food for thought. It's not a simple field at all, to to say the least. There are many different things to to take into consideration. That's for sure. But but no, this has been a very enlightening discussion. And Evan and Hanley, I just want to thank you for your time today, and thank you to. Daryl, for joining us as well. That's actually all the time we have today. So Evan, Hanley, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate your time. And thank you to our audience today for, for joining us on Seed Speaks. You can join us next week when Alex Martin is going to tackle the topic of breeding and food insecurity. So this is Mark Zinkowitz signing off for the day. And have a great day, everybody. <laughs>